this way to do this. There's some seats up here. There's some seats up here. If you want to come up here. David, could you take those trays back and then there'd be room for people to sit? Yeah. year's theme is Our Children, Our Future. This afternoon, we are going to begin with the, some words of welcome from George Belitzos. George Belitzos chairs the Iowa Commission on the Year of the Child. He is also the Executive Director for Youth and Shelter Services here in Ames. One of his particular areas of concerns is the Indian Child and Juvenile Justice. I would like to just point out to you, there are brochures on each table and also some brochures at the door if you haven't had a chance to pick one up. There has been a change in the evening speaker. United Airlines has contributed to our problems, and John Redhorse could not get out of California. And so Don Ross, who is superintendent of schools in Macy, Nebraska, will be speaking tonight at 8 o'clock in the gallery. I'd also encourage you to fill out the registration forms uh, we would like to know who, who is here, and also we would like to know if, of your interest in helping us in future years, uh, giving us ideas, if you have any ideas of the kind of program you would like to see. The symposium has been going on now annually since 1973, and we're always looking for new approaches and new ideas and new uh, areas to explore and to, to study and to celebrate, as George said. I would like to now introduce George Jackson. Dr. Jackson is di Director of Minority Student Affairs at Iowa State University. This is his first year here, and we've spent some time talking with him about Indian students on campus and some of the events that the Minority Programs Office has helped us with, and we are very pleased by the support we've received from that office in planning and implementing this year's program. George? Thank you, Gretchen. <clears throat> I am indeed honored and pleased to have been granted the opportunity to introduce our noonday speaker on this special occasion, the Year of the Child. Our speaker today is a family person married to Vance Snavy. She is a scholar having graduated from South Dakota University with a bachelor and master's degree. She's an author, having published numerous books, some of which she brought along with her for your personal view. And she's also the holder of the Phi Beta Kappa key. But more importantly, she is a Native American who has shown her interest by her works and by her dedication to her people. So it is indeed fitting and proper at this time that I introduce to some and present to others Mrs. Virginia Dravenhoek, Ms. Dravenhoek. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. That was just a, a real nice introduction, and I am not used to being introduced that way and having nice things said about me. And no matter how many times it happens, I feel that I'm a very lucky person because so many good things have happened to me in a relatively short time. Uh, it's only been about eight years since I've had any success as a writer. and. Uh, you know, there is a little temptation, and sometimes I might get a, a big head from all of that attention that a writer does get. But I always remember something that happened shortly after my first book was published in Flandreau, South Dakota, where I live. Now, Flandreau is a very small town of about 2,500 people. 
And like all small towns, we share each other's joys and sorrows, you know, and everybody knows everybody else, and we mind each other's business quite well. <clears throat> so when my first book was published, that caused quite a bit of excitement in this little town. That was the first time they'd ever had a real live author in their midst. So I got all kinds of congratulatory notes and telephone calls, and there was a big feature story in the local newspaper, and um, then the television in Sioux Falls did a few things. And so all of this attention, you know, is just really something. Then one day, I, I, after our local paper came out with another little picture of me in it, I was admiring myself, you know, picture in the paper, and this woman came to my door. And I knew who she was, but merely as an acquaintance, not as a, a close friend. But she burst in, and she threw her arms around me, and she proceeded to go on and on of how pleased she was to know that there was a real live author in Flandreau, of all places, even if I were an Indian, gee whiz, you know, to have a real live author in Flandreau, and she just kept going on, and I tried to be very gracious and thanked her, you know, and she just kept going more and more, and what a thrill it was, and all of this kind of stuff, and then she said, you know, I keep a scrapbook, have for years, of every important thing that happens to people in Flandreau. And I have the picture of you from the paper and the story from you about you from the paper in my scrapbook, right next to the stories about people who've died. <laughs> okay. I have been writing for over 20 years, but it wasn't until I started writing for children that I had any kind of success. And I really hadn't thought about writing for children, hadn't even tried, because, um, you know, I had the dream of writing the great American novel and that kind of thing, and uh, thought that was the way to go. But when my children were old enough to start reading and going to the library and things like this, I suddenly became aware of what children were reading, particularly about the American Indian. Then I, you know, became even more conscious of the view that my, child, my own children had about the American Indians and, you know, things on television and in the movies and this sort of thing. And I, this had all been here in the back of my mind before, and I knew that th there were inaccuracies and all kinds of stereotypes. But it really hadn't hit home until it started affecting my own children. My family and I lived in Iowa for a while and this was where my eldest son was born. We lived in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And um, he had a little exposure to his Indian relatives during the summer when we'd go back home to the Rosebud Reservation to visit family. And it was always during a powwow time, so he would see Indians, you know, all dressed up in costumes and dancing and the drums beating and this sort of thing. And all of my relatives back home have horses, and they'd always go horseback riding. And so he had, in his own mind, this view, image of the American Indian as being a very colorful, exciting thing, you know, riding horses and dancing all of the time. Um, when he was four years old, when we were living in Iowa, my uncle and aunt from the reservation came to visit us. And this is the first time they had come to visit us when we lived in Iowa. And we were all very excited about their visit. And my little boy was just beside himself with excitement. This was his um, favorite person of all, and he always had to go see Uncle Harvey when we went home. And he told all of his little friends how excited about, you know, he was, and his Indian uncle was coming to visit. Well, the day that they came, there must have been about a half dozen or more little boys camped out in our front lawn waiting for this Indian uncle to show up. Well, finally, oh, I, I can't remember the time of the day, maybe about shortly after lunch, my uncle drove up in a blue air-conditioned Oldsmobile, and he got out of the car wearing, uh, you know, just casual slacks and a sport shirt, and he had ordinary shoes on and glasses, and um, his hair was very short. And when, you know, the excitement of seeing them in the flurry of greetings and so forth, I 
noticed that my little boy just went out and shook hands and but didn't say anything and then all of the other little boys were suddenly gone. It wasn't until after my uncle's visit and after I talked to some of my neighbors I found out that my son Paul had told his little friends that his Indian uncle was coming and that his Indian uncle back on the reservation had all of these horses and he went hunting and he went, went hunting buffalo and oh you know he had this image of this warrior coming. And so they expected someone coming up, I don't know if they expected him to be riding a horse, but coming up with braids. And, oh, and another thing, my uncle had had a picture taken of himself um, at a powwow one time, and he had a roach on, and this was hung in my son's room. And so I think the boys expected uncle to come wearing this thing too. And it was very disappointing to them. And the people that lived next door had a little boy the same age as mine, and after um, my uncle had arrived, this little boy went home, <clears throat> and he just had the most unhappy look on his face, his mother later told me, and so she said, what's the matter, Stevie? And he said, you know Paul's Indian uncle? And she said, yeah. What about him? Well, you know, he looks just like anybody else. He was so disgusted and so very disappointed. Later, a friend of mine came to visit us, and this was after we'd moved back to South Dakota, and she was responsible for getting us into uh, teaching in Bureau of Indian Affairs schools. And she told about how one Thanksgiving, she taught first and second grade, they were making pilgrim hats, you know, for Thanksgiving, and uh, Indian headbands to wear for a little program that they were going to put on. And there were two little girls, little Indian girls in her class, and they had their headbands done and put them on and looked at each other and said, oh, you look just like an Indian. <laughs> now, I'm sure you've all heard, too, how about Indian children who've gone to movies of cowboys and Indians or, you, you know, the army and Indians and wagon trains and that kind of thing, and how they are often cheering when the troopers come riding up, you know, to kill the Indians because that was they were expected to do. The Indian children have for a long time believed what they were reading in books and what they saw on movies and on television about the things the way the American Indian was supposed to be. The Indian was always either savage, ugly, dumb, drunk, lazy, usually lazy, and um, then there was the other extreme, where the Indian was a very noble person with very pure ideals. Uh, these were two extreme points of views, and these have both been constantly reinforced in children's literature. There are thousands and thousands of stories about the American Indians in children's literature. And I'm not going to name any authors or titles or anything like this because I don't want to start any feud, but particularly I don't want to give the impression that these writers deliberately lied about us. For authors, writers, as you know, write about things that they know or from their own experience. And many of these authors, uh, their experience was only a second-hand thing from the research that they had done or perhaps spending a summer on a reservation or something like this. And a lot of them did have a very sincere desire to help Indian people. And I certainly cannot condemn that sincerity. But usually Indians in children's literature, chil uh, Indian children, have generally been presented in a very glamorous, idealistic, noble red man type of characterization. We have lovely Indian myths and legends that have been told and retold many, many times. The idea that all Indians are natural born artists and work well with their hands. This has been, uh, everybody thinks that. Indian girls are usually shy and modest and maidens or princesses and they always wear uh, buckskins and beads. Little Indian boys would stalk bra very bravely through woods or ride, you know, beautiful horses and save their tribe or white settlers from some great disaster. And they wore um, very little clothes, you know, just a breech clout, moccasins, and feathers in their hair. 
This idealistic characterization and the opposing one, the negative view of bloodthirsty uh, Indians, and the lack of knowledge of the general reading public, you know, knowing very little about the American Indians at all, has handicapped American Indian writers. For readers know the stereotypes and they dislike having their fantasies disturbed by reality. And there have been many aspiring Indian writers who found it very difficult to get published because after all publishers are businessmen and they are in the business of selling books and if people aren't going to buy books and they're not going to get published. Um, it was difficult to, um, for me to break in because unknowledgeable editors, you know, are usually in the East where they know very little about American Indians and very little about this part of the country at all, and they're unknowledgeable. And some things were labeled that we knew to be true were labeled as being improbable. It was very discouraging to have one's creative expression limited to what the publishers think the public would buy. However, there can't blame all, all of this on publishers or filmmakers and that kind of thing too because I really believe that we, the Native Americans, the teachers and the parents of Indian children must also bear some of the responsibility for continuing and perpetrating all of these inaccuracies that are found in literature, television, and so forth. Um, you go back, you know, um, Indians and Wild West shows. Now, this was a, a release for a lot of Indians to get away from the hated confines of those early, uh, very destitute, uh, starving reservation days. And they were fed well and they made money traveling in, uh, you know, like Wild Bill, uh, Bill Cody's Wild West show and some of the others and had went to Europe and all, had all kinds of experiences. But that is where the image of the American Indian as being a feathered warrior on a horse was set to the extent that people all over the world believe that the Plains Indian is the way all Indians in the United States are. Now I can remember as a child <clears throat> on the Rosebud Reservation and going to a movie with my parents and it was an, an exciting time. We were all excited because there were Indians from the Rosebud Reservation in that movie. They'd taken, gone out to Hollywood and made this movie. And uh, the story was not about Sioux. It was something set in the Southwest about Apaches. And uh, they were killing these uh, settlers or something. Uh, I don't remember all of the details uh, at the thing. But they were Sioux Indians. They weren't Apaches. And the whole audience just roared with laughter when these Apaches spoke to each other and they were speaking Sioux. Oh, you know, we all laughed and thought, talked about that for months of how silly and all oh, those dumb white movie makers, you know, they do such funny things. But we didn't make any protest and neither did the Indian actors. Um, then, of course, there was Tonto. We used to love to watch The Lone Ranger and my children did too. But uh, this, you know, just continued, this image. And for a long time, we did nothing about it. We didn't make any uh, protest. We didn't say, hey, wait a minute. If you're going to do this, do it right. Things have improved a little bit. But even in South Dakota, where we have a population of Indian people that has been estimated to be about 50,000 now, our white neighbors know very little about us. I speak to a lot of uh, elementary school children. They are very disappointed when they see me coming like this. They still expect buckskins and beads. They still believe that people are living in teepees. And many times, because of some of the things that have happened on the Pine Ridge at Wounded Knee and, and the demonstrations and this sort of thing, their parents are afraid to drive across the reservation. So there is a, still a great need for understanding and communication. But as I said before, it wasn't until I myself was a parent and had children of my own did I realize the danger that we were uh, putting our children, our Indian children, by exposing them to these inaccuracies. 
They were growing up to believe that Indians were either supposed to be very noble and very pure, but they soon realized that it was impossible to live up to that kind of an ideal. Or they were learning, and this was the most dangerous of all, that the duh, ugly, the dumb, the treacherous, and the stupid Indian was what they were expected to be. And children then acquired a very negative image of themselves. And to be an Indian, to admit to being an Indian, became a very shameful thing. Now sociologists and psychologists, you know, they're always studying things. And they have well established that these kinds of negative feelings engenders and perpetrates undemocratic and unhealthy attitudes that will plague society for a long, long time. Now, I write about Indian children. And my stories are usually contemporary fiction. And I write about what I know best, and that is Indian children in South Dakota. And any one of my uh, stories um, could take place on any one of the Western reservations in South Dakota today, with one exception. This uh, one here, Betrayed, is a historical treatment. This, that's not a contemporary one at all. But the Indian children in my stories could be real children. And I write about their experiences as truthfully as I have known it growing up on the reservation, as my children, my brother's children, have experienced it. And I strive for accuracy. <clears throat> I always have some element in all of my contemporary fiction of tribal tradition and uh, past experiences of elders. And there's usually an older person, a grandmother or a grandfather, as a member of the family. And this person usually is a major character. I write about the closeness of the family and the concern for the well-being of everyone in that family and the, how, the, uh, how one person's uh, behavior would affect the whole family. And I don't, I'm, I'm assuming that you know that we have an extended family system so that we don't just have a mother and a father and brothers and sisters. We have many, many other mothers and fathers and grandmothers and so forth. And this could be my whole family right here, you know, part of it maybe in this whole room. So when I say that the behavior of one indi individual affects the whole family, it's just not mother, father, brother, sister. It is, oh, you could go on and on. So you, um, I write about these things, and I try to show that the spiritual life and the everyday activity of an Indian cannot be separated, that uh, Indian people have traditionally had religion as part of every aspect of their life, and you can't separate it as, you know, like your church is over here and everything else happens here. It's never been that way. I have rather an idealistic purpose, I suppose, in writing fiction for children, and even in the adult nonfiction that I do. But I really am concerned about correcting misconceptions and untruths which had been so deeply entrenched for so many years. But I also try to show that an Indian child is very human, with the same needs for love and for security as children everywhere, just as the needs that are presented in this brochure. This is very true for children everywhere. Um, <clears throat> Some people have the idea that just because a child is Indian, that person is you know, really, really different. The different part is, of course, comes from the uh, heritage and the cultural background, and this adds to the child's individuality. But it does not mean that they have different needs, very basic needs at all. I'm going to go very briefly uh, I brought a few of my books along here and give you a, just kind of a brief sketch of what I have tried to do. This is my latest children's books, and it's called The Gee Chee Hoo Hoo Boogeyman. And I'll leave these up here, and if you want to glance through them after a while, you can. Now, I assume you know what a boogeyman is, or a bogeyman. 
This is the imaginary specter that uh, uh, non-Indian parents use to discipline their children. You know, if you, you better be good or the, the boogeyman will get you or, or don't go upstairs in the attic or the boogeyman's there and that sort of thing. Well, the Gigi is the Sioux equivalent, sort of, except that there are, there's a cultural variation there in that the Gigi is also a spirit and that can do some very strange and remarkable things like maybe making a child disappear. So that the Gigi has a little different meaning then to a child. The Huhu is the Hopi equivalent of this imaginary specter. But to a Hopi child, it's very real because they see their hoo-hoo. A hoo-hoo is a kachina. And this uh, once a year, the main purpose of this kachina is to visit every family in the mesa and check up on the children to make sure that they're behaving themselves. And uh, he, you know, wears this mask and the children know that it's a man under there, you know, any, an ordinary man, but with this mask, so that it's a very real thing to them. When he comes into the house, he makes this noise, hoo, hoo, so that's where the name comes from. He really has another name besides that. In this story, there are three little girls, and they're all first cousins, and their parents have married. Uh, one is married to a non-Indian, so that's where I get the boogeyman. One is married to a Sioux, so that's where we get the Gigi. And one is married to a, a Hopi, so we have the Hoo Hoo. And these three little girls invent their own imaginary character, which they call the Gigi Hoo Hoo Boogeyman. And I'm not going to tell you about it, so I don't want to spoil it for you. <laughs> Jimmy Yellowhawk was my first children's book. And I wrote this uh, for a contest, which was sponsored by the Interracial Council for Minority Writers for Children. And much to my surprise and pleasure, it won first prize in the Native American category. Now, th in this story, there is a 10-year-old boy who doesn't like his name. And this is a very common thing among children. He feels that his name uh, he's called Little Jim. That's a baby name. And he is growing up now, and he thinks he deserves a more grown-up name. And the story is based on the boy's experiences in trying to get a new name. Now, in using the theme of the name change, in this book, I was able to write about how the Lakota people uh, were named as children and how they could have many names, particularly a boy, throughout their life, and how they were named after something perhaps that they did which was very brave and courageous or something that was very foolish. And the boy eventually does change his name, and again, I don't want to spoil it for you by telling you how that happens. This book is called High Elk's Treasure. Um, this one uh, deals with horses. Uh, the Lakota people, the Sioux Indians, loved horses, and they still do. And this is a contemporary story, again, set on the reservation. And I tell about how important the horse has been to the Plains Indians, particularly uh, this uh, Lakota tribe, and how that love for the animal has uh, still been retained in, uh, today. I go into history a little bit here and give the Indians' viewpoint of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And I introduce the uh, idea of someone who has killed Custer and an old legend. And um, in, as in all, most of my contemporary stories, I take something from the past to show how it can affect the behavior of the child in the present. I have one more children's uh, story, which is contemporary fiction, and I didn't have a copy of it. And that one is called When Thunder Spoke. Now, it is based on the legend of Thunder Butte in, on the Cheyenne River Reservation in western South Dakota. And I originally just wanted to call the book Thunder Butte. And as you know, Butte is spelled B-U-T-T-E. And my editor urged me to change the title, she said, because children, particularly your 
uh, white middle class children in the East don't know what a butte is and they're going to mispronounce the title. Now that had never occurred to me, so I did change the title to High Elks or to When Thunder Spoke. Uh, in that story, I, I wrote about uh, some of the traditional things that all Plains Indians had, particularly the act of counting coup, C-O-U-P. And that was the striking or touching of an enemy, which was considered a much braver thing to do than actually kill the enemy. And I, I have the boy in this story uh, find an old coup stick which has uh, some mysterious power and some very strange and unusual things happen to the young man after he uh, finds this story. Now the legend of Thunder Butte um, is that on a very clear day when there isn't a cloud in the sky and the sun is shining, uh, the thunder can be heard and it seems to come from this particular butte on that reservation. And the person who hears that thunder is very fortunate because some very good things are going to happen to that person. So it's a good, you know, a legend. It is a, it's not a, a bad, negative thing at all. And I was out on the Cheyenne River, River Reservation uh, at Eagle Butte. It was, well, it was a year ago in April. And the children had not heard that legend out there because, you know, we're getting away from the grandmother living in the family or the grandfather and being the one to tell the stories to the children. And so they were went home and said, did you know? And well, maybe their parents did know. But well, how come you never tell us these stories? And I, the fact that I had told the story about something where they could actually see this butte, some of them from their homes, um, really was kind of a, a pleasure to me in a way because it did get some of the families the older people in the families remembering some of these legends and telling them to their children. In fact, then the schools had some of the older people come into the classroom to tell the children legends and uh, some of the older ways, which were going to be forgotten unless they had been continued. My fifth children's book is for an older group. It's considered uh, a historical novel for young adults, and it's based on some actual happenings during the Minnesota Uprising of 1862. And uh, it's, it has to be for an older group of children because the subject matter is a little on the violent side, and it um, uh, is told from the point of view of three main characters. One of the most rewarding things about writing for children is the fan mail that I receive from children all over the United States. It is, is really great, you know. I write for adults, too, nonfiction, and I always get mail, usually not as much as I do from children, but the mail I get from adults is always negative, you know. You made a mistake here, you misspelled this, or you dropped a participle, or, you know, why did you say this, and that kind of thing. But from children, they Oh, their praise, you know, the good things they have to say. They are so frank about what they like and what they don't like, and it's just really a wonderful thing. And uh, even if I never made any money at all from selling my books, these letters in themselves are a great reward. The best letters, though, and those which I appreciate the most are from Indian children, particularly on the reservations in South Dakota. They can truly identify with the main character, the boy or the girl in my stories. The grandmother could be their grandmother or their grandfather. The horse could be their horse. And the reservation could very easily be their reservation. And they are very proud and very pleased to know that they can have somebody that they know, and they really feel that they know, house in New York. Yeah. 
I don't know. They are. Who asked for them? Um, in Jimmy Yellowhawk, for example, I write about a family uh, who could be living on the Rosewood Reservation where the father is a rancher and it's a, a rural background, you know, agricultural background. And um, their economic status is on the lower end of the scale in just about every case, uh, except for in the Geechee Who Boogeyman, there is a variation there um, from ranging from um, uh, an uneducated family to one of the family members uh, gone through college and that kind of thing, trying to show, you know, that not Indians are not all poor, nor are they all uh, a doctor either. <laughs> how they feel about it. Well, I, w I would like to think that it would. I um, have tried to show through the, the characters in the, in the stories, uh, particularly with children, that maybe there's a conflict sometimes of appreciating what an older grandparent, you know, says about the way things used to be. And maybe there uh, might be a little bit ashamed about being Indian. But still, there is maybe that coming to understand and be proud of it. And then also how um, the legends uh, were used to teach, and that the, the stories themselves, as they are told today, can still be used to teach important values. No, the, the books I do are uh, um, more of a scholarly historical nature for adults and deal primarily with South Dakota and South Dakota Indians. No, I don't deal with that in my book, adult books, no. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to remind you that the next part of the program is at 2 o'clock in the gallery. Uh, the title of that session is Growing Up Indian, and Bill Bean, who is with the Department of Public Instruction, will begini be beginning that session, and there will be a panel of respondents, and if I might add, if any, if the people, the respondents are here, would they meet at 1.30 up in the gallery, please? And please fill out one of the forms. Thank you all for coming. See you the next couple of days.